Yo, day by day, we got to come on strong, prove them wrong. Yeah. Y'all hear him? That boy Acker gave me some stuff, didn't he? Yeah. So we gonna we gonna go ahead and prove him wrong today. I got I got my brother in here today with me, man. I'm so so uh, honored to be able to get this interview with my brother. You know what I mean? And so a lot of you guys know him. A lot of you know, you know who he is in the industry. And some of you might not, but I know who he is. And to me, that's all that really matters, man. I appreciate my brother. Um, I got the opportunity and and really blessed to be able to work with him close hand and see all the stuff that he got going on. And we worked for the same companies for a while, been able to do the same things. But, you know, I want to give my brother the proper introduction and say, man, Sean Casey Twin Cuts, welcome to the Apex Podcast, my brother. Yeah. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening, big bro, man? Thank you for having me on the show. I'm excited. Man, man, I'm excited, bro. You know, I know we get to talk all the time, but we don't really get to talk in politics so the rest of the world can hear. So I'm, 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 a, I'm appreciative of this one, bro. So, man, let's jump right into it, man. Tell the people who you are. Tell them, tell, tell them what you're about, because I know all about you. So I'm going to just let you go ahead and, and do your stuff, man. Tell them who you are. All right. My name's Sean Casey. I'm from New York. Originally live in Southwest Florida. I've been a barber for 20 years now. I live in Southwest Florida. I got five barbershops called Twin Cuts Barbershop. Um, work with a couple of companies in the industry. Uh, and this is um, where me and John actually are, 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 are partners and co-workers there in Andis right now. So we're for Clipper Company. I do, uh, do some stuff with Paul Mitchell, the school here in Southwest Florida as well. So I'm just doing some educating, some training, some haircutting, and overall, I'm just a barber, man. Just a barber. You said you're just a barber, man. That's all you I'm are? just a barber. I'm man, a barber. How you, you're just a barber with five barber shops, but I'm, I'm going to leave that right there. You know what I mean? Man, uh, you know, I, it, it's cool to see the people that I genuinely care for see that success. And I, I, I'm happy to be a part of just watching all the stuff that you got going on and understanding like your growth and your development. We've been able to share the stage together on numerous occasions. And then now you, you know, I opened up an invitation and asked you to be a part of the popular nobody family. And you said, yeah, to jump in there because you, you said something that was interesting to me that the reason why you wanted to join the family was because what? I mean, we were already friends. So if you just tell me to do something, I'll rock with you. You know, I do that with any of my people. If they got something positive, they got something going on. And if I can contribute or if they're, they're looking for me to help in any way, I'd love to be a part of that, man. Strength yeah. in numbers. Strength in numbers. And also, too, you said something to me that was very unique that most people don't get and most people will never understand is that, you know, if you got somebody like-minded like you that's doing the same thing and going in the same direction, why not do it together? Why not see each other succeed together? And so to me, that's what always stood out. It was like, yeah, your, your mindset was somewhere else already. You was already like, yo, let's keep pushing. Let's keep pushing this line and let's keep moving together. But what, um, for the people, what got you into barbering? Being a teenage dad, having a kid in high school. That you know what I mean? <laughs> Had to figure something out really quick. I was, love going to the barbershop wait three hours for a haircut on the weekends because that's the day we didn't go from school, listen to the guys. They would make jokes. I thought it was a fun time. It was, a, it was something to do every Saturday morning, get up with like three of your people and say, yo, first one to the barbershop and get online and wait three hours to get that haircut. And while I was sitting there, I was just yep. fascinated with it, you know? So being fascinated with watching them cut hair was something when the decision came like, <laughs> hey, well, all right, you're not really going to college. And you're not doing anything else. What do you like to do? And I was like, ah, oh, barbering. And that's really what got me into it. Man, uh, let's let's touch bases on being a, a teenage dad for a minute because I think so many males struggle with they they have a kid early on in life, mm -hmm. and then they think like the military might be the only way out, or they continue like a street life, and some of them never get the opportunity to jump into a trade. 
and you took the trade route and now look at you five barbershops killing it in Florida, left New York. And, and so let's talk about being a teenage dad for a minute. Like how was that in your transition of trying to become this five shop owner and how is it still affecting you today? Man, it was super scary at the beginning. You know, you, 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 you're hearing in high school, like, Oh, uh, I'm pregnant. And you're like, uh, okay. So <laughs> Pull out what, what direction am I having? I'm working on the, at the movie theaters on the weekends, collecting tickets. Like what is my path in life? But, um, you know, I really, I really was one of those kids that just, I don't necessarily think I'm, I, I'm not a bad person, but I was kind of a loner. And put, during that time, I was surrounding myself not with the best and not doing the best of things. So I was trying to find exactly what I was trying to do. And I think, you know, I believe God put something in, in your way, to, a challenge to make you better. And I believe that was his challenge to me. And, and, and thankfully it wasn't death or getting locked up or something else. It was a responsibility of a child. And I think he understood my heart. And when he went, when, when that ch a challenge came, I stepped up to the plate. I said, well, this is my responsibility. I need to stop what I'm doing and right. move forward and have, have a respectable, uh, try to be a respectable father. And back then I, I'm, I'm not as mature speaking about it back then as I am now. I was more scared, but it was, a uh, Father, fatherly intuition it just got me into figuring out what I wanted to do and to this day I mean my son is the biggest inspiration in my life every time I move forward and do something he's really the the forefront of me getting things accomplished day by day you know what bro that's 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 a blessing because I kind of felt the same way about my daughter I wasn't a teenage father but I was young and everybody around me was kind of like, bro, what are you thinking? Like you just threw your life away. And I think uh, so many times that's what young, young men hear is like, and young ladies here too, like you throwing your life away. But I think you are somebody who was able to take that ability and, and take all of those negative words and things like that and turn them into a positive and use them as a driving force to make you get focused, make you focus on success and look at the bigger picture now. It's not, not only about you. And I think when you say that that was your blessing, it's like you can, you're always going to be thankful as a father for, you know, uh, Sean Jr. Because of the fact that he was the reason that got you focused in life and got you ready to go and, and put that fire up under your feet. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I know New York could be treacherous. I know it's a crazy lifestyle in New York. It's always fast paced and people moving around like crazy. So what, what was it that made you transition from New York to, to Florida? So it, it was my son. So I'm almost, you know, I was born and raised into New York. My grandparents moved from New York to Florida. And I was just getting into, you know, eighth grade going into high school. And while they were moving, they were, you know, the re they they gave me the, the the offer like, hey, do you want to come down with us to Florida? The schools are going to be a little bit more relaxed. They're going to be better. Um, what do you think about that? And I made that decision to move with my grandparents and go to Florida. So while I was in Florida, it was just, an, it was culture shock for me. It was, we're talking <laughs> about, you know, mid nineties, things were different from New York, a fast paced New York and going down to, you know, I'm not in Miami, I'm not in Tampa, I'm in Fort Myers, Florida. So a little bit, you know, much slower, especially back then. And while I was in high school, the girl that I was dating my junior year, senior year, you know, that's, that's what happened. We, we got, we got in a situation, intimacy and, you know, a child being born. And when he was born, I moved back to New York. So it was like that decision I made living in Florida was I need to do something with my life. And I wasn't doing anything right here in Florida at that time. I was really lost with a child with no direction, no, really no education. I didn't do well in school. I just did what I had, had to do to get by, but I didn't have a direction or any goals of what I wanted to do with my life. So when I made that decision, I spoke to my father and he gave me a choice. He was like, yo, you know, you have this kid, he's four months old. What are you going to do with your life? And he said, I said, that's where I was like, uh, barbering. You know, I had a little trimmer and I used to do like the little John B beard and stuff all the time for the movie. Try to look cute for the girls. Did you, did you just and, say John B? Everybody called me John B in school, man. Every single <laughs> person during that time. We're talking about the time when he was popping. When he was so popping? That, that's the year. Like we talk about, are you still down? Tupac him, right? So oh. 
Yeah, so in high school, that's what, like, everybody used to hit me. And my name's Sean Johnson, so it was funny. But I did have, you know, that was the time when the little skinny beard was popping and not too many kids had the beard in the middle high school, I mean. So a beard, I would do bro, it. You look like you had that beard since you was, like, eight. Like, yeah, man, for real. <laughs> like, in high school, dudes was like, yo, you got the beard for a minute. So I would do it, right? Because, you know, the barber would charge me extra and I had no money. So I'd be like, yo, I do the haircut. I would have to do my own beard. And then, like, some of the kids in school were like, yo, you, you line, up, line up my beard? And then it was like, yo, you cut my hair? And I was probably murking them and killing them. But I kind of liked it. So that's where the idea was, oh, I'll do hair. So my right. pops in New York was like, all right, well, if you want to do hair, you know, the best schools are here in New York. So I think one of the things is, one, is because it's a progressive city. Two, he wanted me to get out of my element that I was stuck in in Florida at that time and right. expand. So that's what I did. I got out. I, I moved to New York. Um, I kept, you know, back and forth. I would every couple of months, I would spend a long weekend, see my son. And I did have, what I had to do. I stayed there for about six, seven years in New York doing that till my son was six turning seven. And then I made that move back home from New York back to Florida. Okay. Well, yes. Yo, that's... I think it's funny to talk to so many barbers around the world. We all kind of got some type of connection that's the same of why we chose the industry. It was either an influence from a parent or influenced by cutting our own stuff or we just was in a situation and this was the only option that didn't cost a lot of money. And, and just going into that, you know, what do you feel right now? Because you're a father. You have a, a beautiful young girl, you know, and then mm -hmm. you have Sean Jr. And so as a father, how do you feel about uh, parents nowadays only pushing college, 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 but instead of, you know, saying go to college, go to college, I'm a father that say, yo, I'd rather you take up a trade and then go to college or take up a trade and never have to go to college because, you know, what we're looking at right now is there's a lot of debt happening before kids can even get a head start. So how do you feel about it? Like, I know, you know, Sean Jr. is in, in one of the shops working. I know he went to a Paul Mitchell. So how do you feel as a parent, most parents, and, and what advice would you give most parents when, if they are stuck in that mindset of that, you got to go to college? Well, I think that's, that's a big part of, we're, we're creatives, me and you and any, everybody I feel in the, in the hair industry. We consider creatives more than adaptives. I believe you're adaptive learner or you're creative learner. And I think society is built up for adaptive learners. You, you're, a traditionalist would be you do good in school, you build up, you do great in college and you get a career. But then there's a lot of kids that are just creative and do awful. Like I couldn't even stand in front of a, a classroom of 12 kids and talk about history. It was very uncomfortable for me. I was very shy. And me being shy would, would, would not allow me to really to speak to a lot of the other kids. So it kept me in my own corner. And I don't think this, uh, uh, at that time, a lot of um, the school system understood that. So people like us can fall behind and get forgot about. But yet, look at it, when I found a passion in hair and found something that I love to do, I stand in front of a thousand people at times and speak about something that I love without feeling shy at all. So it's about finding what's, what's about that person. Now, as a father for my son, um, I wanted him to go to college. I wanted him, I want, you know, like any father, I wanted him to do good in high school and go to college, but I wasn't pushing. I wanted to see the direction he was going to uh, do in high school. So I always encouraged him. I always helped him. I always tried to give him ideas. It was him really coming up to me and saying, yo, dad, I want to do, I want to be a barber. And I told him straight up, I'm like, well, how about, we do a couple of years in school. And if you don't like that, we can go into a trade. And he's, he was like, dad, I really don't even want to do school. I just want to get into doing hair. So I said, all right, cool. You know what? It's a cheaper investment for me, one, <laughs> right. to put him in hair school for 10 months. And if he's not crazy about it, then he can revisit the, a situation of maybe going to college. But now he has a trade that he can cut at the college and make a little bit of money. He always has a job under his belt. So he had to prove to me, like, he was like, dad, I'll bring in a couple of people. Cause I'm thinking he's just saying he wants to be a barber because he looks at, he looks at the rewards of the hard work that I've done for over 20 years in my career. So he may look at it like, Oh, barber money is great money. But we, we all know 
that's not for everybody. You know, the, you as you know the sacrifice it gets into to make some good money. Sacrifice is a key word, bro. It, right in this industry. So he brought a couple of friends over and he did their haircuts, and I was like, wow, I didn't show you just by observing me. And so he showed he had, had a passion. So he went to school. He loved going to school. Got out of school. Started at one of the shops and. I was watching them today yeah, as well. I went over by the shop he was at and was really like down. I was like, man, you're, you're, you're doing it. He found his passion. So it worked out for me. So it worked out for him, actually. Ain't nobody listening, bro. It's just me and you. So you, you probably cried, huh? When you see, when you, when you feel good about it. Cause I know you, I know you probably soft hearted when it comes to little. Oh, well, for my kids, I'm super soft hearted, but sometimes <laughs> my mentality is always move, 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 move. That yes. even with my own life, Yes. I have to start to re like to evaluate what's going on. And my dad tells me that all the time. Cause he's always like, yo, so how's this? And I'm like, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. He's like, but that was like, you're not trying, you're doing stop. Right. You know, you're doing it. Pay t- like take a stop to uh, take a second to sit back and say, Hey, you're doing it. But I'm always like, yo, I'm trying to na- make this next step. So I think with my son, sometimes it is unreal. It's, sur- it's surreal. Like I see him, and I went with the flow, but when I actually sit down and chill, I'm like, wow, man, he's he's growing and he's actually doing <laughs> what I'm doing, you know? So uh-huh. it's pretty okay, so, cool when you think of it that way. So the real question is, who better, you or him? I Hopefully, he's going to be better no, than No, me, no, no, no. I'm not, not saying hopefully. Set. Right now, right now. Who got the better hand right now? Who got the better fade yeah, right man, now? Yeah, man, Sarah man, he's still got a while before he gets to um, that championship belt, brother. You get, know, before we, before we talk before. about a lot of experience. But it's <laughs> start that he got. You know what I'm saying? Hey, because you know it's bad. It's bad when the kid whipped the dad ass. So <laughs> he got even though no, there's no whole bar. Like he's gonna have to prove, prove. But listen, I didn't have a palmage of school. I went to Atlas Barber School, just mm. just a little hood little barber college in Lower Manhattan, and you know, never saw the instructor, and you learn from the barbers, and then you go. In your shop, and I didn't. There was no YouTube. There was no. Uh, I couldn't connect and meet like how we met. That that industry didn't exist for me. There was no hair shows. There was none of that. So I just had to grind and cut hair. That's all I knew. What he's got, he's got me to help, which he's all about his independency. But he went to Paul Mitchell. He learned scissor, long length hair, color, barbering. Then he goes to one of my shops and worked with this crew. Then he works at another one of my barber shops and gets a whole techniques from another crew now he's at his third twin cuts and he's learning from those guys and now he's learning how to be like a manager so where he's at at 21 where i didn't own my first <laughs> shop i started cutting hair at 19 i didn't own my first shop till i'm 30 so i had an 11 year you know you had practice so, yeah you had a, yeah. you had a rough uh, rough 11 years where he come out the gate and it's all uh, the plate the food is cooked already all he got to do yeah. is eat it and hopefully wash the dishes right. You know That's what I mean? That's it. So you know, mean, by the time he's where I'm at in 10 years, he's going to be smoking me. I'm... Yeah, he's he's going to z- zoom past you, bro. Quick. Yeah. You know what's, what's, what's so crazy, too? Just speaking on Lil Sean for a second, man, I got an opportunity to, when we did our tour and we hit the road, it was a blessing to be able to have him with us just so he could get that other side of that experience too and and be able to travel a little bit where some people don't have those type of mentors or father that put them in a position to let them see what it's really like to do what we do. And I thought that was pretty awesome. We got some dope footage of us on the road with him. And, yeah, that you know was I mean? another experience that, like I sit back and I look at it, it's like, damn, my son, we traveled to a bunch of states. He was around me. He was helping, he was helping us out, move things around. And he, he was absorbing. And that's another tool he's going to have. Like, that's yeah. that's a priceless tool for a kid that age. And I think he was just graduating from Paul Mitchell at that time. So yeah, it was like he finished to, the same week. And then we right. took off. We and took off. And to listen to you, Trev, me, Stormy, the whole team, getting in front of crowds, how they interact, how we speak. That was a whole other element that a lot of people don't get to see. And he yeah. saw it many times. So he's he's in a great position, man. Yeah, he's in a great position. He deserves it, too. He's a great kid. But, yeah, kudos to you, though, as a father, though, bro. Like, you put him in a position to do something that you didn't even get an opportunity to do. And and so I think that speaks volume for uh, you as a father, you know. And I know Pearl is going to have the same opportunity just in whatever she chooses to do because you're choosing to put yourself 
in a position to help your kids further themselves before they even know it. And so, like I said, my hat go off to you. If I had one, bro, I'd tip it off to you right now. But um, it's always good to see that. Now, let's get into some, some, some serious talk, man, because uh, this was a touchy subject to me because I ain't never really had to deal with a homeboy or somebody I call a brother close to me dealing with uh, cancer. And I know I was one of the first people you called when you, when, when you started the process. And that's mm -hmm. to show like what kind of respect we got for each other. But then I was also one of the first people you called when that thing was in remission. So walk us through that journey and tell the people, because I think so many people get caught up in the world of like, my life suck, my life is bad. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do this. Or they might get some type of illness that somebody might put a date on it and say, you might not make it past this point. And you are sitting in front of us right now as a survivor. And, and tell us kind of that journey, bro. Like, tell us what you had to go through, what you dealt with, what was the diagnosis right. and all of that. Yeah, well, I mean, I was living my life. I had, uh, at that time, four shops and just managing and cutting hair. Everything was going great. Like, that was a period of my time where I was in the gym, so I was feeling healthy. I was eating right. I was, my shops were doing well. I was uh, uh, traveling on the weekends. I was uh, teaching up to school one day a week or two days a week. Like my schedule was full. I couldn't complain. It was like, it was blessed. My kids were happy. Everything was going. And just one day, like driving to the gym, I don't know what it was, but my thumb went ex like, for some reason it called to touch underneath my throat. And I feel this little like marble. And I'm asking a few people like, yo, you, you know what this is? And they said, uh, uh, I don't know. Was, I have swollen lymph nodes or whatever, whatever. And then all of a sudden, within that two-week span, it started from one, and then it stopped in the back of my head, and then it was another one on my jaw, and they were, they were getting big. So the one in the back of my head really made me concerned because I'm, I, you know, I shave my head every day in the shower. So when I felt it, it was like, wow, this is this is not this is some crazy. So I asked about Sean. I said, yo, is there something here? He's like, yeah, it's swollen. So I go to the doctor, and um, I grew up, you know, my grandparents were the type. You, I don't go to the doctor a lot. Right. You get hurt, you got to really be hurt to go to the doctor. It's like, you know, bones got to be showing. Bro, I don't think no male really just goes to the doctor. No, like, in general, I've never remember my pops just being like, yo, I got to go to the doctor. You know what I mean? Yeah, I it was think... the walk it off generation. Like, my grandfather was like that walk it off. You got to walk it off, get some rest. My grandmother made me some soup or something like that. And just relax. So I'm walking around. When I look back, I... I the symptom I probably had was I was wondering why I was tired, but I just thought I was overworking myself. So that's why I was tired. Well, I go see a doctor. She puts her hands on my neck. And the first thing I seen in her eyes, they open up and she steps back and she goes, I need you to take these tests immediately. And wow. here is my business card. I'm here Tuesday, fr th Friday, and Saturday. If you feel any way, please come in. I don't care if I'm busy. I want you to come in and, you, and I'll fit you in. Wow. Right then, I knew something was up, and I went through a bunch of tests, biopsies, PET scans, CAT scans. I was doing all these radiation uh, um, x-rays and stuff, and I guess when I did my, my PET scan, it comes back, and it was all like in the x-ray, was glowing all in my body. Wow. I was leaving Vegas, a hair show or a class I was doing in Vegas, and on the airport, about to walk on a plane, I get a phone call before that seven-hour flight home. It was like, uh, you have possible lymphoma and we need to give you, uh, uh, we need to get a biopsy to see what it is. So I ended up having a grade three, very close to grade four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm. And as it goes, grade three is pretty much my whole upper body. Grade four is actually in the brain. And that's why it was starting to get, the lymph node was starting to try to fight it off by where my head was. So from that point on, you know, that plane ride was difficult. Like I, that you want to talk sure. about, like if you were sitting next to me, brother, you would have been like, who is this emotional dude sitting next to me? <laughs> you know, I'm listening to music. I'm trying to find my eyes. All I could think of is like my daughter's starting kindergarten. My son is finishing high school. I'm not going to, I'm not going to see my daughter grow up. Because I'm thinking cancer is death. At that point on, I'm thinking cancer is death. The time I get to Atlanta for my layover, I already had thought out every solution, and I said, you know what? 
just go with it, man. What do I have to do tomorrow? I'm not going to live like this. What is the next thing I got to go to tomorrow? So I got to the point where I had to take my test. I did eight months of chemotherapy, very aggressive chemotherapy. It was all, um, it was pumping directly from my collarbone into my heart and pumping out because it was blood cancer. So I had blood cancer all throughout my blood. And uh, that was rough. I mean, it was a very difficult time. But my thing was, if, if I was going to go out, man, I was going to go with us. Like, I was going to be happy today. If I die tonight or tomorrow, I want to be happy today for my kids. And not just so they looked at me as a happy person, but, yo, know, I got the experience right now. If I dwell on it, I might miss out on the opportunity of Pearl running up to me and giving me a hug or my Sean coming up to me and saying a few things. It was the smaller things that meant a lot more for me. And even having chemo on a Wednesday, eight hours of chemo, on Thursday, I was in the barbershop. I wasn't working my full days, but I was going in there maybe a couple of hours, three hours. I was getting out of bed and doing what I needed to do and work. And I was just like, yo, I'm just going to, I'm going to try to fight through it as, as best as I can. Yeah. Even changing up my diet, doing whatever I need to do. And thankfully, God willing, I was able to get through all the chemo tests. I get my PET scan. They look at it. They said, hey, you're, we don't see any signs of it. You're in remission. And I've been in remission for two years. And I just went to the um, oncologist two weeks ago. And he said, man, your blood is in fantastic shape. There's no reason for us to give you any more PET scans. Just if you feel anything, just please come. But right now, you're one of those cases we feel very, we feel very confident about you and that you beat this. So, Man, that deserves a hand right there, bro. That deserves a hand. You know what I mean? That's, that's big, bro. That's big. Now, on the flip side of that, because some parent on here is listening, they probably have cancer, fought cancer, but nobody really talks about the kid's perspective. How did your mm -hmm. kids manage with you having to go through all this, seeing, seeing you, because I know how I laughed with you having no eyebrows and no beard. And we could yeah, laugh. Yeah. We could joke about it because we, yeah, yeah, yeah. like I said, we brothers. And if somebody else would have laughed at you, I probably would have... <clears throat> You, I probably would have hopped ahead, but yeah. you know, how did your kids act and how did they, how did they feel or what temperature temperature would you say they were at when they watched you go through all of this? My daughter was too young to understand, but she knew something was up because the, as, as I got midway through my treatments and it was really starting to beat me up, I, I had to, I still got up and did something every day and I still worked all the way through it but I was cutting my days in half and I was going home and I was resting. I was staying in my bed and she would come and uh, just sit by me and rub my head. And she was just, she knew something was there, but she didn't quite understand it. Sean, you, Sean, he's super reserved with everything. He's super cool. And I didn't think he wanted to make me nervous about anything, but I knew he knew something was up because he, he was the one who was like, what grade are you? in? What stage are you in? And when he said that, I said, oh, okay, he's doing research on it. What really hit him and hit me hard and talking about the beard situation was my beard was like this, you know, and I had my first treatment in three weeks. I knew when I was showering, I was touching it and a few hairs were coming out. But literally when I woke up in the morning, by, it was like this, uh, two hours later, I shower and I go like this to my face and a whole middle of my beard just came out. So for everybody that, that, are listening and not watching Sean's beard right now. He looks like a little builder bear. So you could just imagine what his beard <laughs> looks like right now. So just imagine getting in the shower and you wipe your face and the middle of your builder bear beard come off. And it's like, you're lost right now. So yeah, I just want to get in that visual, bro. Yeah. So listen, so that is like, that's all I know how to look for myself. That's my image. That's my photos. That's everything. You know what I mean? For me to get that drastic change, it wasn't like, I faded it down and cut it lower or whatever. This was like gone. So then I do that and I start like kind of taking it off and then I just shave it off. And he walks into the house and he looks at me and I see him stop and I get up. And it was the first time I seen his, in his eyes that he looked at me and said, damn, my dad's not Superman. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he was quiet and his pupils popped like a dilated and I walked over to him and I hugged him and I had to go to the bathroom. Then I had, that was the first time I really like water came in to cry from it. That was the first time I was like, wow, he looked at me different. 
and I stayed in the bathroom for a second. I went into the, my bedroom and he knows how to lighten things up. He's a fool like us. He makes jokes. So he comes in, he goes, Hey pops, you know, you look a lot more richer now. You look like <laughs> He said, I'm with no beard. You look like you got money. Kind of look like Lex Luthor. So, <laughs> so he, he made a joke of it and, yeah, that was a whole nother element, man. We get so used to, like, our vanity and our look and how people perceive yeah. us that, you know, I still went. I went to London. I went to Vegas. I did a hair show in Atlanta with no beard. And it was like to get up on stage and do that. That was awkward, at the, especially at the beginning. But that was a great thing to overcome. If I have to say I took anything from that, that was a mental change. It says no matter what changes with, with me or even my, my look, if you are your – if you are what you are inside, that's what people attract you. So there was a lot of people who never met me before who n didn't know I even had a beard. So their reaction to me was like just meeting somebody who's cool. And I like to build with you and vice versa. I was people, the energy I was feeding off the people and creating that same energy. And that was a good head boost. Like, you know what, forget it. Like I like the way my beard look on me, but I don't, it's not what makes me. My vanity is not what makes me. My, my comfortable image and look is what makes me. It's what's, inside of here and what I like to talk about and what I like to build and want to share. And, and a lot of it has to do with yeah. our industry or hair. Yeah, and, and you know what? I can't say that about you, bro. Like you really don't give a damn how people perceive you because you, you, you know what I mean? And anybody who fought through what you fought through and building the empire that you building, I wouldn't give a damn either. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you, you could have lost everything and your kids could have too. But you chose to make the conscious decision to say, you know what, I'm not going to let somebody else dictate when I go out. And, and that's what I mm -hmm. admire about you, bro, that you stood tall. You did the things because I, I know I love food. I know you love oh. food. Oh, I, well, and, I do. And yeah, I know. And I haven't seen them plates. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I know you. this is how you know somebody really like food. When you start uh, uh we didn't do even go. We didn't even do a GoFundMe. We just did a send some money to Sean Cash app so that he could get a barbecue pit as a birthday gift. That was so you know when you start doing stuff like that, you really got good friends and you really like food because you was like, yo, let's get this barbecue pit for your boy. I'm like, yo, let's do it. I've been using it every day. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I know it's hard to give up food. And you have to change up your diet. You have to change yeah. up your routine. You have to do everything. So I know that's hard, bro, because that, that food thing is crucial right now. But I think it's like a natural instinct, just the same way I had my child. And it's a natural love. Like, I, was, I wasn't ready for it as a teenager. Right. But I just naturally adapted to it without any knowledge. I think it's a human tendency. So I think my mindset set me off with, um, with, uh, with the same ideas. Like, it's just like, yo, I got to, I got to, I know chemo's gonna chemo's poison, but it's gonna kill the bad cells, but it's also gonna kill the good cells. So I have to eat things to keep me strong while the chemo's doing what it's doing. So I ate holistically because I believe in holistic, and I would have probably loved to do holistic if I was in stage one. Right. I gave that a run, but since I was really at that point where I had to, you know, I, I it was too risky of a gamble to go into it. So I said, why don't I do all the holistic things? while I'm doing the medication as well. And I think the mm -hmm. mindset had me just being a business owner too. Like the, the thought of when I first opened up my business and the AC would break or a barber would leave or something, it really affected me. It bothered me. And then within time and learning experience, I was like, what's the solution? You know, I can't be mad about it. Somebody leaves, what's the solution? When you find somebody, if something breaks, I have the solution because now I'm prepared and I saved up for uh, mishaps that happened in the barbershop so I think when the cancer came I think being a business owner also helped me because it was like what's the solution to this then sitting back in and and being hard on myself or sad or depressed it was like all right I'm going through it there's nothing I can do about it I have to do what it has to what I, what has to be done eight months of chemo it is what it is what's the solution and every day was just like get up was the solution. Just try, take a next step and try to push forward for the next day. That's, that's, that's dope. Now, speaking of solutions, you know, we all, we all going through the same ways of the world right now. We all 
you know, doing what we got to do to continue to push. And right. Just like I said, being able to be your friend and talk to you and, and, and know you and understand you, you made some business moves um, to not just better yourself, not just better your barbers, but you made a business move that I think most barbershop owners should probably reach out to you and, and talk to you about because you're trying to better the industry, not mm -hmm. just you are your barbers. But one thing I want you to touch base on real quick is how did you better your barbers in a time where people were leaving the industry because they didn't know if they was going to be able to survive? So, you know, when, when the shutdown first happened, you know, it was like, wow, what's going to happen? Did I lose everything that I worked for? And we're talking about like early March, like when right. things were, or mid-March when things were brand new. And then all of a sudden governor's like, yo, you got to be closed. And it was real. That I went back to the same mentality, the same way I've done all my life was, okay, I thought about it. My emotion was nervous about it. I accepted being nervous and concerned and, and, and even upset and all the emotions that come with it. Now, do I stay in this way or do I reevaluate what's going on in my business? And that's how I passed the time by. So I looked at it like in two ways. I said, all right, look at your business, reconstruct your business from within without talking to anybody. Look at the things you're doing good and look at the things that you could be doing better and look at the things you're doing bad at and be real about those things and try to adjust it, plan and prepare for if the shop opens. Now, if the shop never opens, my next thing would be like, okay, what else am I gonna do with my life? Save my money. Now maybe it's time for me to cut hair in a city again or freelance. I built up a resume. There was, there was something in the back of my mind is, hey, you've done a lot of work where Okay, if you lose your businesses, you may put yourself in a situation to do something else. So I was, I was looking at, at all angles, but it didn't take away from the fact of what do I have to do to, that if my business comes back to survive, but not only do the things that needed to be readjusted within my business. So when I opened it up, one of the things I looked at was my team. Like, you get so comfortable hiring and, and, and making money and you, you know what your money's coming in every week. And sometimes the environment or not everybody that's working on your team, you're just kind of like everyone's individualist in a way. You got some right. guys that are down with you. Some guys are have outgrown your company, but they're sticking with the company. Some people shouldn't really be in your company, but you're there and you're just like, all right, well, they're paying money and the shop's running and the shop is good and I'm going to do what I need to do. But I needed to change my business to make it a system. I had to make my business run like the, hey, you got to do it like Bill Belichick. You don't have to have a lot of stars, but you have a system that people believe in, and he's going to take you to championships and win championships. Mm -hmm. And it's not about the individual player. So I had to look at it and say, how can I develop this team, but at the same time not make it all about me? What can I do to better my team on their side as well? So. One of the biggest issues I've realized with all of my barbers is a lot of guys are out of work right now. And a lot of guys have been um, cutting under the radar. They're not showing their, they, I don't know, a lot of them haven't been doing taxes. A lot of them don't save their money the way they need to. And there's a lot of, it, a big reason of that is because they're not looking at their finance. Right. You have to see what you're doing on a daily, weekly, monthly, and annually, uh, annually to create growth for yourself on all aspects, but especially with business and finance. If you make $100 a day at a minimum, say you make $100 a day, but you go to Applebee's, you buy a dinner for two and you buy some drinks and then you go to the movie theater and you go here and you get gas and stuff, you're always never having money because you're not looking at what you're bringing in. So I had to come up and, and, and create a system, say, hey, you know what, I need to have data. I need to give everybody their own virtual assistant I have to give them all their own booking app where I can see everything on my end for my business to grow because I want to have the data for my business as well as give the, the, the barber the, the opportunity to look at his, his um, revenue right. as well as giving him a virtual assistant where he can print out his own 1099s at the end of the year and he can give it to his accountant. I even give them financial advice to help them create their own LLC open up their own business, uh, their business bank account. I tell them now take the, 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 the money that you're making and taking in and tie it into your business bank account. Because if, if we get shut down again, 
here's your opportunity to have a paper trail. You have paperwork. You can now apply for unemployment. You're as an independent, you are in, you're on paper, a uh, uh, individual contractor with an LLC sole proprietorship, you can apply for an SBA loan right now. You don't have to just sit back and say, oh my God, I'm not cutting hair anymore. And how do I feed my family? A lot of my guys were paying, some guys were doing week for week. They had to wait for the last haircut of the day to pay their rent money. Mm -hmm. So you being shut down for eight weeks, how, that's scary for some people. Yeah. And I didn't want to see my team go through that. So how can I get them out of that situation while doing what's best for my business and it came together and I had a meeting when we got out of, um, of quarantine and was ready to start to shop. He was like, we're opening up May 11th. And on that Friday, I called up the shop. I had five meetings, took all day long. I already put together on paper an agreement contract. I put together a policy contract. I had everything laid out. I already was making deals with, with the company uh, for their, their, their booking app, their virtual app. So I didn't know I was going to open up, but I was all prepared. Thank God I was doing it in early stages and waiting for it last minute. So when we were ready to open up, I had those meetings. Everybody that was down with it, they jumped on. Those that weren't, they had the opportunity. Yeah, there, there's a lot of other places you could keep doing exactly what you're doing. Just you do it somewhere else. And some mm -hmm. people where I just felt like wasn't going to fit in with the system was my opportunity to say, hey, you know what? This is not really going to work out for both of us. And that's where we're at right now. I'm, I'm, I, I got a team of barbers that are now looking at their, their finance, looking at their numbers, setting goals for each other while I'm working on my end, looking at the data, where I can help, what shop needs a little bit more push, what advertisements and goals and, and, and what is the clientele that's coming into certain shops where I can create discounts and coupons and thank you advertisements, whatever it needs to do. I, I know where to place it on both ends. And I feel like I'm in a better place with my business now than I was before quarantine, even though I'm taking a much bigger hit because I don't have full barbershops and business is not the same because people are still kind of afraid to come into a barbershop. What's up, Sean? To come into a barbershop and uh, because people are scared. Another thing is your weekly clients aren't weekly anymore because there's nothing to do. There's right. not a place to go. So your weekly clients are maybe every three weeks. So that slows it down and we're in summer in Southwest Florida. So with all that being done, what's the worst thing that happened to me? It's happening. So might as well structure my business to be in its best position it can be. So once we get out of this, which eventually we will get out of, my, my hand is dealt. My, 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 my cards are on the table and I'm ready to, I'm ready to, to hit a jackpot, man. Yeah, I love that because we talked about it. So I, I had an insight <laughs> of what you was doing and I thought that was pretty awesome. But that's why I wanted to make sure we touch bases on that because I feel that's something in our industry that is missing, that business aspect of the barbershop. We, we tend to be the drunk uncle of the lawyers and the doctors, and we're licensed by the same people, but we don't get that same respect. And what you're doing there is giving the opportunity to your guys to have that type of respect. And uh, man, that's, that's much needed, and it's much, much appreciated in our industry, I'm sure. Uh, so we talked about you being a teenage father. We talked about cancer. We talked about... Uh, the, the shop owner, but now let's get into something that you're starting to dive into more in that virtual world and that uh, mm -hmm. the Sean Casey Academy, man. Let's, let's, let's shed some light on that Sean Casey Academy. I done seen the videos. I love them. I done used a couple Appreciate of them. It. And I, you know, you. I, I'm a fan of how you teach. And that's, that's part of why we work well together because I am a fan of yours. And so let's, let's, let's dive into that, you know, Sean Casey Academy real quick. Tell them about it and, and what you got going on there. So it's a virtual academy that I created. Thank God I did it before the pandemic because a lot of people are doing virtual stuff now. So I already has put a budget to the side and I worked very hard, you know, traveling and stuff to create money, to create content, to put together this full academy. And what I did was I started off with um, seven haircuts, two women, four guys, uh, five guys, two women, um, all, all textures, all, all texture of hair from beard, from beards to haircuts, to fades, to natural hair, to, to whatever it's all there in these seven haircuts so that's like my first module that's somebody can come in they can just say hey, you want to learn the techniques there it is and part of that academy as well you get the business side there's a second module is how to um start and build your own barbershop so you get a business side and you get a technical side and then on top of that before the pandemic i, I haven't done a lot of uh new footage just because my production team can't travel 
to come see me, but I have enough right Ooh, now. He said his on, production on. team. Look at you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, so I, I have uploaded content every month, whether it's interviews, special guests, whether it's small things, just how to adjust a clipper to certain how to hold a shit, whatever it is, small things that we need in the industry to just help you. So it's an academy that you sign on, you get your technical, you get your business class, and each month you get uploaded content of things that can help you grow in the industry. So again, another one, uh, man, yeah. like Khaled, boy, you always got another one, you know what <laughs> I mean? Uh, but Sean, my brother, it's, it's been a pleasure, man, to have you on with, with me, spend this time with me. I know I took some time away from your family as Sean just walked in, you know what I mean? But I just want to thank you. And like I said, bro, give you your roses while people still alive. Cause I think it's important for people to see that, uh, two strong minded, successful individuals can come together and make a great partnership, but more so not even a partnership, a friendship and build like brothers. And so, uh, any last words before, before we get out of here, you know, get the people your info where they could find you at. And then just some parting words before we end this. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for having me, John. I've always been, you know, outside of friendship. I'm a big fan of you and your work. And I always credit you for all the hard work and sacrifice you do with your family. And I've seen behind closed doors what it takes to be on your level. And I don't think I ever even want to get to that level <laughs> and give that type of sacrifice, number one. So that's why I'm doing the virtual stuff now, but because I don't want to do what you do. But I give you so much credit for that. And thank you for yeah. having me on your show. Um, where you can find me is Twin Cut on Instagram, Twin Cuts underscore CEO. Um, and if you're interested in my Barber Academy, you can go to SeanCaseyAcademy.com. You can try it out for seven days. You get one free video. Check it out if you like it, and you can sign up onto it. It's got three tiers. I appreciate it. That would be awesome. I'd love to get the feedback. You guys can hit me up on my Instagram and tell me if there's certain content that you would like to see from that as well. That would be awesome. Excuse me. And my parting words would be, man, no matter what you got going in your life, don't be bitter. Be better. Oh, don't be bitter. Be better. And you heard it first from my boy. Well, it might not have even been first. You probably heard it before, but he put emphasis on it. Be, don't be bitter, be better. You know, and so, so Sean, man, thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you for jumping on the Apex podcast where we come off the top of the head, just have good conversation, keep people hunting for more. You know what I mean? So with that, brother, I'm going to clap you out. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Appreciate you. So I want to thank you guys for listening to the Apex Podcast with Sean Casey, Twin Cuts. Make sure you give him a follow. Make sure you, you tell a friend to come back and listen to the Apex Podcast because we only going to get better and we're going to stay consistent. So with that being said, I'm going to sign y'all out.